Welcome to this level 2 chemistry video on reaction kinetics, commonly referred to as reaction rates. Reactions happen around us all the time. Some reactions are slow, like rusting or the decomposition of food, and some reactions are fast, like explosions or dissolving reactions. We can affect the speed that these reactions occur at by changing one of four conditions or factors that control the rate of these reactions. In this topic we will explore the kinetics of a chemical reaction. This is the rate at which the reaction happens at. Learning outcomes are defining what a reaction is in terms of collision theory, defining what the reaction rate is, identifying the four factors which affect how fast a reaction occurs, and explaining what effect these factors have at the molecular level and how they affect the reaction speed. A lot of these ideas would have been presented in the Year 11 program, so hopefully this is more of a refresher and provides a deeper explanation of the chemical principles involved. The first thing we will look at is how to measure the reaction rate. You first need a reaction that has an observable result which can be measured. This is easy if it, the product is a gas and the volume of the gas can be measured. A simple way to do this is to trap the gas in a measuring device like a syringe or an upside down measuring cylinder filled with water. A common choice of reaction is using an acid with a metal like magnesium which produces hydrogen gas or a carbonate compound like sodium carbonate that makes carbon dioxide gas. As the reaction proceeds the gas is trapped and the volume of gas recorded each minute can be written down. This produces a reaction rate graph like this. In the beginning, there is a volume of gas produced in one second, so the reaction rate is fast. This is because the concentration of the acid is at its highest. As time passes, the acid gets used up and the concentration decreases, so the volume of gas produced each second will decrease, and the reaction rate slows down. Eventually, the volume no longer changes and becomes constant. Here the reaction stops, as there are no reactants left, so therefore no collisions can be occurring. Another way to record the reaction rate is to record the decreasing mass of reactants by placing your reaction on a balance. As the gas bubbles away, the mass of the flask will drop. This will give a decreasing reaction rate curve until the change in mass each second becomes zero and the reaction rate has stopped. Now we'll move on to defining the term reaction rate and we'll do this in two parts. First a reaction. A reaction occurs when reactant particles collide with each other. The atoms rearrange themselves into new combinations and form products. But for this to occur the reactants must be in the correct orientation they must be the correct way around and they must have enough kinetic energy to break the bonds between atoms. If the reactants are moving too slow, they will just bounce off each other and no reaction will occur. These two conditions make up the basis of the collision theory. A bit more about energy. This diagram shows the relative energy you need to push a rock from position A, which represents the reactants, to position B, which represents the products. But first, you've got to go over the hump. This hump is, represents the amount of energy called the activation energy. This is the minimum amount of energy needed for a successful collision to occur. Only particles that have this minimum energy requirement will successfully collide and form products. Note, there is a misconception here. The activation energy barrier cannot be reached. You either have the minimum energy to overcome the barrier or you don't. You can't reach it. So don't use the word reach in your responses. The second term we'll define is the word rate. We measure this by measuring the volume of gas produced each minute, but at a molecular level the rate is how quickly the collisions are occurring. So the definition of rate in collision theory is the frequency of collisions, that is, the number of collisions that occur each second. Lots of collisions in one second, a fast reaction rate. Now, there's another common misconception. 
you can't have a fast collision. Either you collide or you don't. So a fast reaction rate is not because there are faster collisions, it is because there are more collisions occurring each second. So don't use the term fast collision in your responses. Now we'll move on to examining the four factors that affect the reaction rate. That is, the factors which either affect the frequency of collisions or how successful those collisions actually are. First we'll look at concentration. Changing concentration changes the number of collisions that occur each second. Changing concentration changes the number of particles that are present in a fixed volume, typically one litre, since our unit of concentration is moles per litre. So with more particles present in one litre, there is a greater chance that the particles will collide, so there will be more frequent collisions and a faster reaction rate. Remember, the reverse happens when you decrease the concentration, usually by diluting it with water. There will be less collisions occurring each second and a slower reaction rate. The second factor we'll look at is changing the particle side of a solid reactant. You can do this by cutting the pieces up into smaller bits, crushing them up with a pusset and mortar or grinding them up, or using powders or metal turnings, like this picture of magnesium turnings which are commonly found in workshops. By using smaller pieces like this, it increases the surface area of the solid reactant, and that's the key. So in this box here, which is a five by side cube, we've only got the area exposed by the large sides of the cubes. But cutting it into smaller and smaller pieces, now we've got a lot more cubes and a lot more surface area. So increasing the surface area of your solid reactant exposes more of the particles from the reactant to the other reactant, typically your acid or something. So if you're using something like magnesium metal, then you're going to be exposing atoms of magnesium to your acid. Or if you're doing a reaction with an ionic compound like sodium carbonate, you'll be exposing more of your ions, in this case your carbonate ions. With more particles exposed, there will be more frequent collisions and a faster reaction rate. This is why powdered substances like flour and coal dust are highly combustible and potentially explosives. We cut wood into kindling, and I'm sure you've hopefully done that before, because it burns much faster than big chunks of wood. And of course, if we're making potatoes, we cut them into chips, because they cook much quicker than a big piece. Remember, the reverse happens when we use bigger pieces. Less surface area means less of the reactant particles will be exposed, so less frequent collisions and a slower reaction rate. And we know that big chunks of wood burn much slower in a fire than our kindling. The third factor is the effect of changing the temperature. At a higher temperature, the products form in a shorter amount of time than at a lower temperature. So changing the temperature of a solution changes their kinetic energy and therefore their speed. Heating up the solution gives them more kinetic energy and now they move faster. There will be more frequent collisions and a faster reaction rate. Cooling down the sub substances decreases the kinetic energy and speed, so there will be less collisions occurring each second and a slower reaction rate. This is, of course, why we put food in the fridge to slow down the rate of its decomposition. One more thing about temperature. We know that changing the temperature affects the average kinetic energies that all the particles have. We can represent this by using this particle distribution graph. At a higher temperature, shown here in pink, as opposed to the lower temperature, shown here in green, at a higher temperature, there will be more particles with this higher amount of energy, as shown by the shaded in pink region, than the lower temperature green region. The activation energy requirement for the reaction is marked here as a barrier. So as we can see from the graph, more particles, this pink region, will have the minimum energy required to react. Therefore, more collisions that occur are likely to be successful and therefore a faster reaction rate. The final factor is using a substance which we call a catalyst. Enzymes are biological catalysts 
and we often use manganese dioxide to catalyse the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide to make oxygen gas in experiments. And if you haven't seen this before, I'm sure you're likely to very shortly, as the typical elephant toothpaste, which is a decomposition of hydrogen peroxide using some detergent to make an awful lot of foam really fast. Note, catalysts are always used to speed up reactions. You can't use a catalyst to slow them down. So what is it? A catalyst is a chemical substance, often a solid, that allows the reactants to come together on like a meeting place. So here's our catalyst, here's our reactants to come meeting on the surface of the catalyst. Here the reactants are able to collide, form products and move off. The catalyst itself is not chemically altered. It is not involved in the reaction, its mass does not change, it is not a reactant. It merely makes the reaction form faster. So how does it do this? The reactants come together on the catalyst, a place called the active site on the solid, seen here in red. Here we have ethane and hydrogen molecules here, binding to the active site on the solid surface, forming this transitional state. The bonds in the molecules are weakened, allowing the products to form and move off. This way of making products is often referred to as an alternative reaction pathway or mechanism. The key thing about this new pathway is that it is a lower energy pathway. The activation energy is lowered for this reaction. And we can see this on the reaction profile diagram. The red line here is the normal reaction pathway without the catalyst. Note they have very high activation energy barrier in order to form products. The blue line is the catalyzed reaction pathway with a much lowered activation energy value. Note that the enthalpy change for the reactant, the difference in energy between the products and the reactants, which is here, remains unchanged. So catalyst only changes the activation energy. This lowered activation energy will result in more of the collisions being successful, so therefore the reaction rate will increase. Gosh, and that's it. So let's look at a summary of the four factors shown here in the four colours and showing the effect of both speeding up and slowing down the reactants. It is a lot to take in. So now you should pause the video and copy this grid down onto your whisk sheet. You'll be expected to explain how both reaction rates can be sped up or slowed down. So don't just focus on the factors that make things go fast. Sometimes we want reactions to go slower. They are safer and much more manageable. After all, we do like our milk to last four days in the fridge and not one day on the bench.